Good morning. Welcome, everyone, to our Easter service of the Harbor Baptist Church. Uh, praise the Lord. It's Resurrection Sunday. Of course, we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord every Sunday. But today is a special day because the world is looking at Easter. And of course, we proclaim the message that it's Easter Sunday, or rather it's Resurrection Sunday, and that the local church has been meeting since that very first uh, day when the Lord rose from the dead and met his disciples. And a little early church met every Sunday, and uh, we meet every Sunday to celebrate the resurrection of our Savior. I'm so sorry that we can't meet together uh, physically, uh, and but there'll be a day when we can. Man, I love to be able to shake your hand, look you in the eye, give you a hug and say welcome and, and happy Resurrection Sunday. I love you and all those kinds of things. So you're just going to have to get a virtual hug and handshake for me and, and my wife this morning. We are praying for you and thank God for the day he has given us today uh, to celebrate and worship him. Uh, let's take our Bibles this morning. Look at Isaiah chapter number 53. Isaiah chapter 53. We're continuing our series this morning in Isaiah uh, chapter 53. And we're going to begin in verse number 10. I trust that you have your Bible today. I'm uh, glad for our other other folks that are listening in or watching uh, this morning as well from all over the state of North Carolina and different other areas. We want to welcome you also and thank you so much for choosing uh, the Harbor Baptist Church uh, to look at and listen to. Uh, the and thank you for celebrating Easter with us, the resurrection of our Savior with us. And we trust that the services will be a blessing and a, and a, a great time for you as well. Isaiah. Isaiah chapter number 53, Isaiah chapter number 53 and verse number 10. Have you found it in your Bible yet? Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah uh, chapter 53 and verse number 10. Here the scripture says in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse number 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. Let's pray together. And Father in heaven, again, we are so grateful and thankful today for this day that we get to focus on uh, as a people and of course people around the world and churches around the world to focus on the resurrection of our great Savior. Thank you for the victory that we have in Jesus Christ. Thank you for eternal life and a home in heaven. Thank you, dear Lord, for walking with us daily and knowing us by name and keeping us and guarding us in even this present hour. Lord, we know that if we were alone, we are still never alone because you are always with us and we're grateful and thankful for that. Lord, have your way today in the message. Speak to every heart. May every believer, every child of God be encouraged today the preaching of God's word. And may, if there's anyone watching, listening, uh, that does not know you, Lord, let today be the day when their heart is spoken to, when they come and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Change all of our lives. Lord, I am but uh, dust. I am but a man, but you are God. Let your word speak through me as simply your messenger, we will give you the glory, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, for the last past five weeks, we've been in a series called Against All Odds. The series is based on a monumental chapter in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter number 53. Isaiah is an incredible book, and chapter 53 is an incredible chapter. The prophet Isaiah recorded his prediction 700 years before Jesus was born. Isaiah 53 describes 24 actions the Messiah would experience that were all fulfilled 
in Jesus during his passion week. The Lord, uh, rather Isaiah predicted that the Messiah would be despised, betrayed, and rejected, that he would be silent when facing his accusers, that he would bear our sorrows and sins. And by bearing our sins, he would heal our spiritual sickness, iniquities, and that he would pay the price for our sin. Isaiah predicted that he would be successful, which really is an understatement because with over 2 billion followers in the world today, not counting the two, uh, the time has passed over 2000 years, Jesus Christ is by far the most successful person that ever walked this earth. And then the final uh, prediction that he would rise from the dead. 24 predictions in all. Count that. 24 predictions in all. The reason we've called this series Against All Odds is because several years ago, a mathematician named Dr. Peter Stoner did some work with probability theory. He sat down and determined the odds for any one person fulfilling eight prophecies of scripture. Stoner's calculations showed that the probability of fulfilling eight prophecies were so minuscule, it would be virtually impossible. Stoner said the chance that any man might have lived down to the present time and fulfilled eight prophecies is one in 10 to the 17th power. One in 10 to the 17th power. That number looks like this, a one with 17 zeros behind it. It's called 100 quintillion. I, I've never counted the 100 quintillion. 100 quintillion, a number that big is hard to grasp. So Stoner illustrated it like this. He said, suppose we take 10 to the 17th power of silver dollars and lay them on a face of Texas. They will cover all the state two feet deep. Texas is a big state. It would Those silver dollars would cover the entire state of Texas and would be two feet deep on Texas. Now mark one of these silver dollars and stir the whole mass thoroughly all over the state. Blindfold a man and tell him, that he can travel as far as he wishes, but he must pick up one silver dollar and say that this is the right one. What chance would he have of getting the right one? One and 10 to the 17th power, 100 quintillion. One and 100 quintillion of a chance of getting that, getting that one silver dollar. What are the odds that anyone could fulfill 48 prophecies of scripture, not eight, 48. That number is so big, we don't even have a name for it. Jesus not only fulfilled 48 prophecies in his death, he fulfilled 332 prophecies in his life. Friend, most of those prophecies he had no, from a human standpoint, he would have absolutely no control over whatsoever. He had no control over the Roman government if he were just a man. He had no control over the Sanhedrin or the Jewish nation, just a man. But he, because he's God, 48 fulfilled prophecies. The Holy Scriptures, the Old Testament told us what Messiah would do. 332 32 prophecies the Messiah would fulfill, and he fulfilled every last one of them. What are the odds? They're impossible. They're impossible. Today, being Resurrection Sunday, Easter, we're not going to talk about 48 prophecies. We're just going to talk about the great prophecy, Jesus' resurrection from the dead. What are the odds that a dead person could come back from the grave? Well, it's been done a few times. Most of them involve an emergency room or an operating table or being trapped under icy water and revived afterwards. It's happened, but not after, not often. Jesus wasn't revived. He was resurrected. Jesus wasn't revived. He was resurrected. You say, well, Lazarus and others, they were raised from the dead. Yes. They were. Lazarus was raised from the dead. There were other instances. Jesus raised a few others from the dead. And there were some in the Old Testament were raised from the dead. But they died again. They died again. Jesus is the first to be resurrected, raised with an incorruptible body. And friend, because of him, 
we will one day be resurrected, raised with an incorruptible body as well. What are the odds that someone who had been crucified and pronounced dead by a professional Roman executioner, a Roman executioner who had thrust a spear through his heart, watched clear uh, pericardial fluid gush through the open wound, showing that his heart had burst and the chambers of it collapsed. His body pried from the nails that held it to the cross, wrapped in 200 pounds of spices, including his face, nose, and mouth laid behind a 2,000 pound stone. Could revive himself, move the stone, walk 14 miles that afternoon and convince his friends that he was completely restored to health? Zero, zero, zero. Jesus' resurrection was a miracle, a miracle. God raised him from the dead against all odds. We make a big deal out of Easter. We make a big deal out of Easter because Easter is a big deal deal. Jesus came back to life, proving God is powerful and proving uh, that Jesus is God. Jesus demonstrated that Jesus was and is who he says he is and that there really is, listen, there really is life after death. Isaiah 53 10. Let's read that verse one more time. Isaiah 53 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. In other words, it pre it pleased the Lord to, to bruise him, to crush him. He put him to grief. That happened on Good Friday. Well, uh, you say, what in the world is good about it? Well, it was good for you and good for me. Wasn't a great day for my for our Lord. It was a horrendous day. It was a horrendous day. Let's read a little further. Uh, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. That happened at the crucifixion. Our Lord was made an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. <laughs> That's us. He shall see his seed. That's you and me. You saved. You are the seed of the Lord. David says it's like Davis, uh, a commentary he says it like this. In verse 10, we come on the deepest and most mysterious aspect of the substitutionary atonement of Jesus. The father's pleasure in the crushing of his son and making him suffer. This is an infinitely sublime concept for any human father who delighted in crushing his own son would be accounted as the vilest monster. But scripture teaches us that the love God the Father has for his only begotten son is so fierce and powerful that the blazing of the sun cannot touch it for intensity. The best explanation of this is Jesus' own attitude toward the cross in Hebrews 12, 2. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising, that is, thinking little of the shame. The delight of the Father in Isaiah 53, 10 is the same as the joy of the Son in Hebrews 12, 2. Not the cross itself. Neither the Father nor the Son enjoyed the cross, but the glory it would win for God and the salvation it would work for a multitude greater than anyone could count from every nation on earth. Friend, if you're saved, that includes you and that includes me. Our names are written in heaven. One day we're going to be part of that great multitude standing around the throne, giving glory to the Lamb uh, because he saved our soul. Is your soul saved, friend? Is your soul saved? You want to be counted in that number. Jesus, when he hung on Calvary's cross, both the Father and the Son and the Spirit knew you by name. Knew me by name. He's knocking on the door of your heart right now. He's knocking on the door of your heart right now. Can I read a little further? The actual torture of Jesus was an agony beyond measure for the father as he showed by darkening the skies eerily and by shaking the ground when his son died. This was immeasurable pain followed by infinite pleasure and joy. You know what that is? That's God, the father and the son looking past the suffering to the final outcome, your salvation and mine. What a God we serve. What great love that such a sacrifice would be made that we may have a home. I think about my son, Jeremiah. I could never watch a, watch a scene. It would destroy my heart to think about how God the Father felt 
as he watched his son. God the Father watching God the Son suffer for the sin of man an immeasurable pain, but at the same time, an intense joy, knowing that one day we'd be gathered around his throne, walking streets of gold forever with him. Let's read a little further. Now listen, the triune God, he loves you so that he will allow such a pain upon himself that we could have an eternal home with him. Further, in uh, Isaiah chapter 53, It says, he shall prolong his days. What does that mean? He shall prolong his days. He will live forever as a son of God and the resurrected Lord. Isaiah is talking about the Messiah now. Let's read a little further in uh, Isaiah 53, 10. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. The pleasure of the Lord is his church, even as Christ also loved the church and what gave himself for it. Prosper. Local churches are in every nation of the world today. It's doing very well. Thank you. Jesus said before going to the cross upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There will always be a New Testament pattern, local church, evangelizing the lost, baptizing the saints, teaching them to serve in the world until Jesus comes back and takes us home. That's the promise of our Savior. Upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of it is prosperous. It is working. It is working in and throughout the world to reach people with the gospel because Jesus empowers it. Verse 11, let's read it together. And he shall see the travail of his soul. God the Father will see the travail of his son and shall be what? Satisfied, satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. Friend, that's good news right there. Jesus will see the final success of God's plan and be deeply satisfied. God the Father is deeply satisfied of what has been achieved. For by his death, Jesus, the Father's righteous servant, has justified the ungodly. You need some proof of that? Go to Romans chapter, hold your finger on Isaiah. Go to Romans chapter four. Romans chapter four. And verse number five, I intend to go a little quick. You might want to jot that one down. Romans chapter four and verse number five. Listen. You know what? Let's start in verse three. It's so good. I don't want to miss it all. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. In other words, if you're trying to work your way to heaven, well, that's not grace, friend. That's debt. That means that God owes you something because you've earned your way to heaven. God doesn't know anybody anything. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Just like Abraham, when he believed God's promises, God declared him righteous, declared him righteous. When he believed that he would have descendants and that the Messiah would come through his lineage, when he believed God for that, meaning he was looking forward to Messiah coming, when he believed God for that, God said, Abraham, I now count you, I consider you righteous in my sight. Not because of what Abraham did, but because Abraham believed because Abraham believed. You can't get to heaven by what you do because you'll never do good enough. You'll never do enough. You'll never earn enough. Jesus on Calvary's cross made the payment for sin and by his death justified all those who believe, declared us righteous when we put our faith and trust in what Jesus did on the cross as payment for sin. That's what Isaiah 53 is talking about. God was satisfied. He said, that's enough to pay for the sin of mankind. What my son did on Calvary's cross is enough to pay for the sin of mankind. More than enough for you and for me. More than enough for you and for me. He was satisfied and went on April 27th, 1988. I bowed my head and asked Christ Jesus to save me, asking to forgive me of my sin. He he saved me and declared me 
righteous in his sight. Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 10.10, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, I'm sorry, uh, Romans 10, 13, whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. When I asked Christ to save me, he clothed me in his righteousness. God looks at me as if I've never sinned. That's, that's amazing. That's amazing. What are the odds that this all could happen? What would happen, did happen? Huh. Let me walk you through the story today. i like all of us to be able to walk away today, able to think through and understand exactly what happened on Resurrection Sunday. All four gospel writers record it. Let me read Luke's account. Let's go to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, we're going to read it through and talk about some things here because we want to put the whole story together, the whole event together. I don't want to just call it a story because it really happened. It's a true story. In that sense, it's a story. It's a true story. It really happened. Luke chapter 24. Are you there yet? Luke chapter 24 and verse number one. Luke chapter 24 and verse number one. You may have read this in your devotion this morning. I'm not sure. Uh, but what a, what a great event it is. Luke 24, verse number one. Now, upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the thir third day rise again. Listen, verse 8, And they remembered his words. They must not have got it when he said it when he was walking around in his earthly ministry. But when they saw the proof, they remembered his words. Let's move on. And returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James and other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulchre, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes lying, laid by themselves, and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. And behold, oh, I said, we're going to stop at 12, didn't I? All right, so what do we know so far? What happened on Easter? Keep your finger on Luke, because we're coming back there. What happened on Easter? At least seven things, seven things, though we only see part of it in Luke's account. Let me walk you through what we know. First, just before dawn, three women went to the tomb to finish dressing Jesus' body. John, the Gospel of John, mentions two Marys and a Joanna. Mark mentions the two Marys and a daughter of one of the Marys, whose name was Salome. In Hebrew, that would be Shalom or peace. So probably four or more women witnessed the resurrection, which is just the opposite of what you would expect if you are fabricating uh, an account because having women witnesses would do you no good in a court of law, since females in that culture could could not testify in a court of law. And th this is not a fabricated thing. God did these things on purpose. The second thing we know is that while on the way, there was an earthquake. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to read it to you, Matthew 28, 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Boy, what a scene. I'd like to have been there for that scene. Of course, when we get to heaven, we're going to see a whole lot greater scenes than that. But boy, what a scene. What a scene. There was a whole lot of shaking going on. Earthquakes aren't common in Jerusalem. They remembered this one. It split a crack in the ground that you can still see there today. I'd like to go there someday, wouldn't you, and see that crack in the ground. Number three, angels announced that Jesus was risen. Uh, we saw that in chapter 24, verse 4. Uh, these angels appeared in the form of men. Matthew tells us that one of the angels appeared like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow. 
Number four, the women reported the news to the disciples, told them what's going on. Fifth, uh, of course, we know they did. They thought it was idle tales. These, these women are crazy. Thought it was idle tales. Didn't believe it. Fifth, on the way to report, they encountered Jesus in the flesh. Mm. That's in Matthew 28, 9 and 10. Six, the disciples didn't believe their report. Luke 24, 11. After all, would you? They just saw Jesus die a horrible death. They watched the Roman soldier thrust a spear up under his rib cage, piercing his heart and having clear fluid gush from the wound. The presence of such fluid proved that the chambers of his heart had burst. And seven, Peter and John investigated the tomb for themselves. They, uh, Peter ran. Peter and John went running. And the Bible tells us that Peter outran John and ran and quickly. You know, John, no, I'm sorry. I got that backwards. John outran ran Peter. John stopped at the door of the, of the tomb, but Peter burst on it. That's just like Peter. Peter burst on in and looked in and looked around and couldn't tell. And we're trying to figure out what in the world has happened. So that's what happened Easter Sunday morning. Everyone was everyone's freaking out, for lack of a better word, wondering if it was true and wondering how they could find out if it was true. Imagine you staggering around all day trying to process this information. You you'd watch the crucifixion. You saw the Lord die. Maybe you're sitting on a hill somewhere. Maybe you were one of those gathered around. Maybe you were close to Mary. Maybe, maybe you were watching from a distance, but you saw that spear go into his dead body. You heard him say, it is finished. And he gave up the ghost. And you saw that spear go into his body and the fluids come gushing out. And then somebody tell you he's alive. You're like, man, I need some proof. I need to see this. That's what, that was the mindset of the disciples. But wait, there's more. Luke also tells us about Easter afternoon. Let's go to Luke 24, verse number 13. Y'all ready? I told you not to lose your place now. Luke 24, verse 13. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And he said unto them, what manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And one of them, and one of, and the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering said unto him, art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem and hast not known the things which have come to pass there? In these days, and he said unto them, what things? And they said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them, which were with us, went to the sepulcher and found it, even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he, speaking to Jesus, then he said unto them, O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Don't lose that verse. I'm going to say it, say it again. And beginning at Moses. Who wrote Genesis? Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, beginning at Moses, beginning at Genesis and all the prophets, including Isaiah. And I bet you Isaiah 53 and all the prophets, he expounded unto them and all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. He went through all the verses, had a Bible study. You remember what in Genesis, what they said? When, when Adam and Eve had sinned and, and, and they covered themselves in fig leaves and God slew an innocent animal, animal and covered their sin without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And, 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 and you know, God had told Adam and Eve the day you eat of this free, thou shalt surely 
die. And by all rights, they should have died physically. They died spiritually. But God forgave them and covered them. The innocent paid for the guilty. And God told Eve he would give her a seed. And that seed would bruise Satan's head. And Satan would bruise his heel. Talking about Messiah. Right there in Genesis. Genesis chapter number three. Right there. He told him. And Adam showed that he believed because he looked at Eve, looked at the woman and called her Eve. They're supposed to be dead. He called her living, meaning he believed the promise of God and he believed that they would live and live again. Friend, I'm telling you, Jesus is all through uh, all the sacrificial lambs, all the way through all the prophets, every one of them. If you look, you can find the Messiah. You can find the promises. You can find Jesus from Genesis all the way through Malachi up into the New Testament as well. Let's, let's continue on. And they drew, verse number 28, and they drew near, drew nigh, and they drew nigh unto the village whither they went. And he made as though he would have gone further, but they constrained him, saying, abide with us. For it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break it and break and gave to them. And their eyes were open and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, did not our heart burn with us, within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the 11 gathered together and them that were with them saying, the Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. Can I say the Lord hath risen? I can say it. I wasn't there, but I know he saved my soul. And therefore I know the Lord have risen indeed. Well, we celebrate, we're celebrating that today. Praise the Lord. He's in risen indeed. All right, let's, let's go on. I get a little too excited. I might preach or something. So that afternoon, Jesus revealed himself to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. We just read that. Luke continues with them now back in Jerusalem. He says this. It's dropped down to verse number 36. And as they thus spake, uh-oh, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, peace be unto you. He says, shalom be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wonder, he said unto them, have you here any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of a honeycomb. You know, I have to try that sometime. Broiled fish and honeycomb. Broiled fish, honeycomb for dessert, I guess. Let's try that sometime. Anyway, and they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of a honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was with, yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets including Isaiah 53, and in the Psalms concerning me, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses, ye are witnesses of these things. All right. So on the night of Easter, Jesus came to the disciples in the evening, probably in Bethany, since that's where they had been staying all week long. Jesus walked through the wall to get to them in John chapter 20, verse 19. Once inside, Jesus showed them his wounds, Luke 24, 40, so that they would believe. Notice that Jesus' wounds are still with him. Uh, I imagine some of them, when they put their hands on the side and thought about that spear going up in, up under his rib cage, and I'm like, Lord, you are alive. Can you imagine? Wow. Oh, move on. 
while he had their full attention, he did a Bible study with them. Jesus explained the scriptures to them. Let's go to, let, let's go to Genesis, work our way through. I want to make sure you get this because I need you to preach it when I ascend into heaven. Amen. And we're preaching it ever since. Praise be to God. From the first to the last, John chapter five, verse 39. Uh, this is what the Lord Jesus told some, uh, some Pharisees when they said, we be the children of Abraham and we going into the kingdom. Jesus said this, search the scriptures. John 5, 39, search the scriptures for in them, you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me and they are they which testify of me. How do you find eternal life in the scriptures? Who, what scriptures, what do the, who do the scriptures talk about? Jesus Christ, the hope of, there is no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved from Genesis to Revelation it's his story. The Lord Jesus Christ, his redemptive plan for mankind in our final state in a place called heaven. All right. That's Luke's account of Easter Sunday. John, who wrote his eyewitness account after Luke's gospel had already been published, wanted to add a few more details for us. So he wrote his own account of the Sunday evening meal with Jesus. He said this. Let's go to John chapter 20. Uh, you're right there in the Luke, John. John chapter 20, verse number 19. The Gospel of John, chapter 20, and verse 19. You're there? Say amen. Well, just say amen to your family, your friends, the wall, whatever. Just say amen. John, chapter 20, verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, when the disciples were assembled, they were quarantined like this, when the door, when the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Shalom, or Peace be unto you. And when he so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. The three more things John wanted us to know, what the Holy Spirit wanted us to know, and he used the Apostle John to write them down for you and for me about Easter were this. Number one, the disciples rejoiced and believed. When they saw Jesus, what they saw, heard, felt, and experienced convinced them that the resurrection really had happened and that Jesus was alive again and in their midst. And secondly, that we have a mission. Even as the Father has sent me, even as the Father has sent me, even so send I you. The Lord Jesus said, as the Father sent me to this earth to seek and to save the lost, he is, I am now, I am now sending you to go and tell the good news that Jesus is alive and that he paid the debt for sinners and sinners as all men can be saved. And then we have the Holy Spirit to guide and empower us. You, If you're saved, you've got the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that convinced you and convicted you of your sin. And when you submitted and repented of your sin and asked Christ to save you, the Holy Spirit came inside of you. Jesus Christ and a person of the Holy Spirit lives within you, empowers you, enables you to live with the characteristics of the Lord Jesus Christ, enables you to understand the word of God, enables you to love like God loves you, for you to love God and others. The Holy Spirit is our great enabler. We have everything we need because of God the Father, the Son, and uh, the Spirit. Easter Sunday was a, was quite a day, would you say? Jesus rose from the dead. He met with and proved himself to no less than 16 people, including four women, 10 apostles. Judas had deserted. And Thomas wasn't there on that first Sunday. It's not good to miss a Sunday, right? Thomas wasn't there on that first Sunday, plus the two other disciples on the road to Emmaus. He walked through a wall demonstrating just one of the upgraded features of what our resurrected bodies uh, will be like. And he ate some fish, demonstrating that he really was flesh and blood, not a ghost or, or an apparition. The resurrection changed everything. It means that there really is life after death and God has made a way for us to get there. It shows God's love for us and that he's willing to endure great pain and death 
that we might have life eternal. It means that there's a savior on the right hand of God who stands for us and prays for and equips us with everything we need through his word and the Holy Spirit. It means that we're not evolutionary accidents. Can I say that again? It means that we're not evolutionary accidents, but intentionally created sons and daughters made in God's image of all of God's love and hopes and dreams for us and with us. It means that life has meaning and purpose and something far better to look forward to in our future. Happy Easter, everybody. He is risen indeed. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. He's the living Lord of creation. He is lamb who was slain for the sin of the world, your sin and mine. He was crucified but he returned. He's the resurrected savior who ascended, who left behind his people to report to us the good news. He is the eternal son of God. He's someone you can trust. And friend, if you don't know the savior, he has shown by infallible proofs that he is real. 332 prophecies he fulfilled. 332 prophecies. 48 prophecies concerning his death. 48 the probabilities of any man being able to do that are impossible. The prophecies are telling us what was going to happen. And we look back and see it happened. Every jot and every tittle of it, it happened. It happened. Jesus came, proved himself, died on a cross, rose from the dead for our justification. And friend, if you don't know the Lord, this Lord loves you, knows you by name. He wants to save you. I believe the spirit of God is speaking to you right now. If you know, if you're not sure you're saved, if you're not sure you're going to heaven, if you're not sure of your eternal destination, listen, today is a day for you. God loves you so much. God loves you so much that he sent his only son to die on a cross for your sin. The joy that they have in knowing you could be saved was is greater to them than the pain and the anguish and the separation that was suffered some 2,000 years ago on Calvary's cross. The joy was greater than the pain. He's looking to you. He's knocking on your door. He's telling you, listen, you are a sinner. There's nothing you can do to pay for your sin. You are incapable of making up for who you are, what you've done. We're all incapable. Jesus paid the price on Calvary's cross. Listen, if he, if, if we could earn our way to heaven, he would not have to pay a price. Why would he do it? Because we cannot earn it. Because we can listen. Because we cannot earn it. He paid the price for us. He suffered the anguish. He suffered the pain. He became a satisfactory substitutional sacrifice for your sin and mine. He paid your debt and mine. And that, and that payment is available. You, friend, must come and receive him. Repent, turn from your sin, and turn to Christ as the only way to heaven. Ask him to come in your heart and save your soul. He will do it. Friend, if you're not saved and you'd like to be, I'd like for you to pray after me. Now, listen, a prayer is not going to save you, but I want to guide you in what one would call a sinner's prayer. It needs to come from your heart, but just kind of follow after me and pray this. Dear Father, I am a sinner. I believe that Jesus died to pay for my sin, and I know that he rose from the dead. Would you please forgive me for my sin? Cleanse me, make me your child. Give me please this home in heaven. I trust you for it. In Jesus name, amen. Friend, if you pray something like that, if you pray something like that, it came from your heart, not some words, not just listening to a preacher, but it came from your heart and you ask the Lord to save you, you're saved forever, saved forever. God has given you a home. I should give unto them eternal, I give unto them eternal life, John 10, 28, and they shall never perish, never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. I and my father one. He says, well, when Jesus saved me, he put me in his hand. 
he is now carrying me in life. And when it's time for me to leave this world, should he tarry, because he could come back any moment, he's going to carry me up into heaven. If you're saved, he does the same for you. You're not earning your way to heaven. He's care, he will carry you up into heaven. Jesus died, rose from the dead, just for you. Just for you. He knows you by name. He's calling you now. Would you receive our great Savior and have a home in heaven? Friend, if you got saved today, please let us know. If nothing else, we'd love to pray for you. Perhaps send some, send some literature to you, some follow-up information to help you to grow in the Lord. Just contact us at harborbaptistchurch.org. If you go to the website and contact us, let us know that we can rejoice with you. The angels in heaven are rejoicing and God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are rejoicing because you got saved. Friend, God, God bless you, church members. God bless you. Happy Easter. Our Savior has risen. Let's rejoice in him. Have a wonderful day with your family. Uh, I know we're separated from everyone, but we can call each other and text each other and, and wish each other a wonderful day. We love, Pat and I, we love you and thank God for you. Can't wait to come. Can't wait to get back together uh, and, and, and assemble in the, in, in the local church together. But until then, we'll keep doing this and we'll keep loving on each other and uh, seeking to reach a world with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You folks have a wonderful day. Thank you for giving faithfully to the Lord's ministry here at Harbor Baptist Church. Without the giving of, giving of God's people, we cannot take care of our obligations here or around the world. So please continue and uh, the Lord will reward you for what you're doing for him. God bless you. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for Easter Sunday. Thank you for the love uh, that you've shown on Calvary's cross, the love for us that you would suffer and die and, of course, raise again, from, rise again from the dead. We love you, Father. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, thank you. Work in us and use us today. And, Lord, I pray for those who've been newly saved, newly born ones today, that you would grow them in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help them to find a good Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church that they may get in and serve. And if they live in Charlotte, bring them to the Harbor Baptist Church. And we will be good stewards in helping them to grow in the things of God. We love you, Father, and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, friends. We'll see you the next time.